So this is from the first campaign, eighth chapter, 36 verses is the prayers by Queen Kunti. She speaks, O Krishna, those who continuously hear, chant, and repeat your transcendental activities, or take pleasure in others doing so, certainly see your lotus feet, which alone can stop the repetition of birth and death. The Supreme Lord Sri Krishna cannot be seen by a conditioned vision. In order to see him, one has to change his present vision by developing a different condition of life full of spontaneous love of Godhead. When Krishna was personally present on the face of the globe, not everyone could see him as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Materialists like Ravana, Hiranyakashipu, Kamsa, Jarasandha, and Shishupal were highly qualified personalities by acquisition of material assets, but they were unable to appreciate the presence of the Lord. Therefore, even though the Lord may be present before our eyes, it is not possible to see him unless we have the necessary vision. This necessary qualification is developed by the process of devotional service only, beginning with hearing about the Lord from the right sources. The Bhagavad Gita is one of the popular literatures which are generally heard, chanted, repeated, etc. by the people in general. But in spite of such hearing, etc., sometimes it is experienced that the performer of such devotional service does not see the Lord face to first, face to face. The reason is that the first item, Shravana, is very important. If hearing is from the right sources, it acts very quickly. Generally, people hear from unauthorized persons. Such unauthorized persons may be very learned by academic qualifications. Because they do not follow the principles of devotional service, hearing for them becomes a sheer waste of time. Sometimes the texts are interpreted fashionably to suit their own purposes. Therefore, first, one should select a competent and a bona fide spiritual master and hear from him. When the hearing process is perfect and complete, the other processes become automatically perfect in their own way. There are different act transcendental activities of the Lord, and each one of them is competent to bestow the desired result, provided the hearing process is perfect. In the Bhagavad Gita, the activities of the Lord begin from his dealing with the Pandavas. There are many other pastimes of the Lord in connection with his dealings with the Asuras and others. And in the tenth canto, the sublime dealings with his conjugal associates, the gopis, as well as his married wives and Dwarka, are mentioned. Since the Lord is absolute, there is no difference in the transcendental nature of each and every dealing of the Lord. But sometimes people, in an author unauthorized hearing process, take more interest in hearing about his dealings with the gopis. Such an inclination indicates the lusty feelings of the hearers. So a bona fide speaker of the dealings of the Lord never indulges in such hearings. One must hear about the Lord from the very beginning, as in the Srimad Bhagavatam and other scriptures, and that will help to attain perfection by progressive development. development. One should not, therefore, consider that his dealings with the Pandavas are less important with his dealings with the gopis. We must always remember that the Lord is always transcendental to all mundane attachment. In the above-mentioned dealings of the Lord, he is the hero in all circumstances in hearing about him or about his devotees or combatants is conducive to spiritual life. It is said that the Vedas and Puranas are all made to revive our lost relationship with him. Hearing all these scriptures is essential. Umigyan timirandha sya gana jana salakaya chaksuhun militam yena tasmai shri gudavena maha ma om vishnu padaya krishna krishna dutale shrimati bhakti vedanta swamini tivamine namaste saraswati deve gurvani pracharine yena sri asunyavadi Let's get your
Mancha Kalpa to Who lives and who dies? Does everybody die? Yes. No. <clears throat> Only those who live for things in this world, they die. Those who live for things eternal do not die because they are above the temporary activities of the material body. The body never is alive, so how can the body die? When you put fuel in the car, the car runs. When there's no fuel in the car, it's just a nice showpiece. So what makes the car run is the fuel. So in the same way, what gives life to this body is the presence of the soul. This, this body is simply Bumer Apanalovayu, Kamanam Buddha Evacha, Ahankar Itiyanme, Bina Prakriti Astada, Earth, Water, Fire, Air, Ether, Mind, Intelligence, and False Ego. These eight elements, five gross, three subtle, combine to make up the physical body and along with the subtle mind. So this is, um, and this is called jada. Jada means dead. The body is dead. It's never alive. When the soul is not there, the body can't move. And when the soul is there, it moves. And it acts and reacts. So life is not this material body. It's simply a combination of material elements, just like everything else. And this world is a combination of material elements. So those who live to propagate the demands and the needs and the pleasures of the body, they live for something that is not real. Because the body, anything in relationship to body, is temporary and ultimately it has no life. The soul is what gives life. And wherever the soul is, as soon as it enters matter, then matter becomes, what we say, animated or active. <clears throat> and so we see in the material world, people simply live for uh, the things of this world, the temporary things which come and go. And therefore they struggle very hard in order to maintain such things or to enjoy these things. And after some time, um, they have to give it all up, and then what's left is nothing. All of it. They simply are not even aware that they are something different in the body, so they think, I die. Prabhupada was talking and was saying that uh, this idea of bodily consciousness is so strong that there's a class of people who are more of the lower class. When the body dies, what do they do? They buy nice clothes and put it on the body, flowers to decorate the body, and various types of ornamentations to give the body a nice look. And everyone will come on and say, oh, so nice. But it's dead. <laughs> what is the use? <laughs> There's no life there. So there's a class of people who, even after the body is no longer functioning, still worship the body by make, trying to make it look like there's still some, some value to it. But it's dead. <laughs> what can you do with a dead body except the fact that, you know, time takes away everything, and therefore you'll get the message after a while, <laughs> it's dead. <laughs> It just sits there. So, uh, and probably I would always say, you know, people will say, oh, my mother is gone, my father is gone, my friend is gone. He's right there. No, no, he's gone. 
He's there. That's the one you know. But actually, what is gone is the life. Therefore, body doesn't have any life. Just like how, how does life begin? The mother provides, uh, she has the womb, which is the uh, conglomerate of the, of the ingredients of the physical material body that's provided by material nature to the, the wife. The father, or the man, injects the soul into the womb, and that, <clears throat> that injection fertilizes the womb, and the womb starts to develop, and then gradually turns into a little pea. That's the, the beginning size, and then from the P, it starts to expand and starts, after a while, nine holes appear, and then the body starts to shape, and at about seven months, the body is completely formed. <coughs> and then very soon it appears, and we call that birth. But what is it? It's the injection of the soul that comes into the womb, that fertilizes the womb, and makes that womb life. <laughs> Otherwise, it's simply dead. So one who lives for this body dies. But one who lives for the soul, or for, for what is beyond the material world, lives forever. Therefore, we say, when we use that Bhakti Vinod Thakur has given us that understanding. He reasons El, who say that Vaishnavas, Vaishnavas means one who lives for Krishna one who lives to devote their life to the service and the glories of Krishna. They live forever. He reasons ill who say that Vaishnavas die when thou art living still and sound. What is that sound? Is that when they are here, they glorify the Lord, and when they leave, they go somewhere else, somewhere else and do the same thing. That's all. There's no difference. So death for uh, a spiritual person, one who has realized his is the difference between the body and the soul actually does not exist. It's just a transformation of location, that's all. That's all it is. We go from one place to another. And so therefore, what is the formula? This verse gives it. One who hears, chats, and remembers, and glorifies the Supreme Personality of Godhead lives forever whether they live in this material world or they live somewhere else in another realm of the same material world, another universe, or the, actually they live in the eternal place where the soul is existing in its natural pure state, the spiritual world. <coughs> Sometimes we say, you want some good news? People like good news, right? You don't die. That's good news, right? Because everybody's afraid of death, right? Shakespeare say, there's the rub, right? That, that, you know, after everything you do, everything is just wiped away. Because everything you do in this world is based on a false idea that you are this material body. And because of that, you create a whole environment of material activity centered around the body or the extensions of body, family members, friends, societies, country, nation, this idea, that idea. But it's all ephemeral to the soul's existence. The soul is trapped within the body, and the soul gets nourishment only when it hears and chants the glories of the Lord. The example is the... Uh, Prabhupada would use that very simple example. The birdcage. You know, a person has a very beautiful bird inside of this very nice cage. But the person's only attendance of the bird is the cage. And they simply dust the cage, polish the cage, you know, fix it up when it's needed. But the bird doesn't get anything. It just sits in there. And then after a while, the person looks in and says, the bird is dead. But at least I have a nice cage. <laughs> <laughs> so the soul is uh, suffering in this material <clears throat> world because it's not getting them any nourishment. But therefore, when one comes to the spiritual life, then that nourishment begins. And what is that nourishment? Srinvata, Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Smarnam, hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. So those who, who do that, 
and make that their goal in life, they, they live eternally. They never die. For them, death is simply a gateway to eternal life. That's all it is. It's nothing, it's nothing to be sad about. People would sometimes come to Prabhupada and they would say, Oh, my daughter, she's very young and she has this disease and she's going to die. Prabhupada said, Yeah, well, death is death. As long as you have a material body, the body has to end. We call it death. But it's not for the soul. The soul lives on eternally. So material life simply means to waste time trying to decorate the dead body. That's all it is. <laughs> Making nice arrangements for something that is actually has no, no life at all. That's why Prabhupada would say, when I see people in this world, I see they're all dead. <laughs> there's no life. <laughs> why? Because they're just like, there's a... If you go to one country, and uh, I think it's in Central America, what is it called? Uh, Haiti. Haiti. It's a country that's really not very. The mode of, the mode of uh, ignorance is prominent. And there are people there who are zombies, because some of my devotees have already visited at that place and they were telling me about. They're half dead. They're actually really dead, but they're still walking around. And they just like, you know, it's like, it's, you know, sometimes they make movies out of that for entertainment, you know. They call them zombies, you know. Sometimes he also would say, hey, you look like a zombie, you know. You know, you know, you just got out of bed and you can't, you're not even alive yet. <laughs> so that's a, that's just a statement refers to something that is, appears to be alive, but it actually is dead. And Prabhupada would always refer the people in that way, because there's no, when there's no Krishna consciousness or spiritual consciousness, there's no life. Although the body is moving, it's going this way and that way and doing so many things. So those persons who did dedicate their life for the service of the Lord live eternally. And those who don't, they have to undergo, they also live eternally, but they don't think so. They, they, they have to, they fear loss, they fear not gaining, they're always in anxiety. But a devotee, he knows what in this world is valuable, it's Krishna, Krishna consciousness. So if I have a lot, it's nice, if I have a little, it's nice, if I have nothing, it's okay. Somebody gives me something, that's nice, I'll use it, Somebody, if something takes, gets taken away, and this is the name, because the devotee knows all of these things come and go anyway. So either you get them for a while, or you get them for a long while. Or you don't get them at all. <laughs> but in any case, they're never there permanently. But, well, what, but the soul, the soul can never be happy with something that is not its nature. That's the point. The soul can only, only finds things... Uh, that give it life. In other words, it's already alive, but it awakens that liveliness by breaking through the coverings that cover the soul when the soul connects with the spiritual energy or bhakti the devotional service. So when a, when a great soul performs activities, they simply dedicate everything to the hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. We have Maharaj Pariksit as the perfect example. He, everything centers around him in the Bhagavatam. Sukadeva Goswami speaking. Maharaj Pariksit is listening and he's asking questions. He wants to know more and more about Krishna, about pure devotional service, about, about spiritual life. He's not, he knows he only has seven days left in that particular body and he's been cursed to die by being bitten by a snake bird. It's interesting. It's an interesting pastime. If you read the 12th canto, it gives you much, much details of that particular pastime. But in that, Sukadeva Goswami, in the, in the middle of the 12th canto, is still teaching or speaking 
Maharaj, are you free from this bodily conception of life? I've given you so much in the form of transcendental knowledge. Have you reached that stage of fearlessness? He knows that, Sukhade, uh, that Mars Pariksha has reached that stage of fearlessness, but he's asking him anyway. Why? Because he's asking it for the benefit of all of us who read. We read the Bhagavatam, have we actually come to that stage where we know that this, everything in this world is temporary, but I am eternal. My relationship with Krishna is the foundation for all of the, all success in life. Why? Because that's what I'm looking for. We look for we're looking for happiness where it doesn't exist in something temporary. And because we keep looking in that area, we we become more and more frustrated, and we think it doesn't exist at all. Therefore, we, we get. We get frustrated and we give up. But a devotee, devotee thinks, why waste time <laughs> chasing after things that will, which will eventually lead me in due course of time? Therefore, Maharaj Parikshit, he simply absorbed himself in hearing and chanting the glory. After six days, Sukadev Goswami had narrated the essential pastimes of the Lord in Vaikuntha. He didn't get to Vrindavan yet. And he stopped and he said to Maharaj Pariksit, do you want a break? A little water? Maybe some rest? Something? And Maharaj Pariksit, he just said, this is what I've been waiting for. Well, Tenth Canto, Christmas pastimes in Vrindavan. He didn't want to stop. And then Sukadev Goswami got more enlivened. When, when the audience is eager to hear, the speaker becomes more and more enlivened to speak, and vice versa. When the speaker becomes enlivened, the audience also becomes. So Sukadev Goswami became really enlivened and became really animated, and he started to really go into Krishna's pastimes in a very systematic way. And so when it was time, he had re give him all of the knowledge that he, he w was required. He left, and he went to meet his destiny. His mother, <coughs> Uttara, she came up to him. My dear son, what did, uh, what did, uh, I'm your mother, you know. <laughs> I want to know what, you know, Sukadev Goswami said, give me some of that. He said, Mother, I don't have time. <laughs> you know, my time is really short. She said, give me something. <laughs> I'm your mother. You know, I'm... And he said, all right. And he narrated Brihad Bhagavatam Rita. So that's where that came from. Which is quite long in itself, but still, he was able to succinctly, very concisely, get to the essence of Brihad Bhagavatam Rita. And then he went on his destiny. He is sitting there in meditation now. He's completely completely absorbed in Krishna. He's not on the bodily conception of life. Then the snake bird appears. The snake bird appears. His name is Toxica. Yeah. He's the king of all of the birds, and he is very powerfully poisoned. So when he's he's going, he's sneaking up to go where Maharaj Pariksit is sitting. But Kashyapa Muni comes and stops him. He said, I have more power than you do, and I can nullify your poison. So don't even try. <laughs> Kashyapa Muni wants to save. But the curse is already there, and the destiny is already about to lay itself out. So Toxica says, all right, let's see who has more power. So Toxica throws his poison and he hits a people tree, and the whole tree just burns to ashes within seconds. And Kashyapa Muni looks at the tree and brings it back to life. <laughs> <laughs> so, Toxica is thinking, 
I can't, you know, do my program. This Kashyapa Muni's in the way. So I have to do something to get him out of the way. <laughs> so he said, well, I got some gifts for you. <laughs> and he offers him really an unlimited amount of wealth and various types of valuable articles. And you can see it in the picture. You see Kashyapa Muni grabbing all of this stuff and he's going away. <laughs> And Toxic is there, so he now he has free reign. And then you know, the curse takes its effect. That's an interesting part of the whole thing. That apparently there was some attempt to change the de but the destiny was already set by the Supreme Lord. So when a great soul leaves the planet, it doesn't mean it, mean, it doesn't mean they're under the influence of the external energy. Prakriti Kriyabhanani Guni Karmani Sarvasya, the materialists, they are under the three modes of material nature, but the devotees under Daivi, Daivi Asha Gurumayi, Mamamaya Dharataya, they're under the influence of the spiritual energy. So when they leave the world, it is by the arrangement of the spiritual energy. And Krishna's particularly in charge of taking back the devotees. He doesn't do it through his energies. Many times he executes his will through his energies, even in the spiritual world. But when it comes to his devotee, he does it himself. <laughs> and he brings that soul back to him. He, and so um, that's special. So that the point is that when a devotee leaves the planet, it's by the arrangement of Krishna directly directly and not simply by the influence of some external disease or this this may you know this may be used to facilitate a person's going back home back to godhead because the material energy works in such a way that the use krishna uses that to facilitate that but actually when the time comes it's krishna it's like some, when we know that a great soul is about to leave, we, we prepare ourselves. We know it's going to happen, but still, when it happens, it's still a shock. It's amazing, right? How we feel that even though we know someone we love or someone who's close to us, or even someone we know in general, is about to leave, uh, still, uh, even though we're prepared, still by that relationship when it actually happens we feel that loss although we know it's coming but we don't really know it consciously we know it in our in our mind but it takes a back seat but when it actually happens and sometimes krishna takes some of his pure devotee in, in instantly and sometimes he carries on where he allows the devotees to develop their relationship more with that great soul so they benefit. Prabhupada did that also. When Prabhupada was about to leave the planet, he went to, of course he went to Vrindavan, and he asked, and he, he not asked, he, he, asked, he said, I want to meet all my disciples. They all should come to Vrindavan, everyone. But unfortunately what happened was Many of the leaders who had projects all over the world didn't want to stop their projects, so didn't tell a lot of the devotees to come. But Prabhupada's request was he wanted to meet each and every disciple before he left. Because he knew if you get attached to your spiritual master, that attachment is your attachment to Krishna. It's the same thing. There's no difference like that. So in order to increase that attachment, that love, that affection, that dedication, sometimes Krishna will extend that loving, that, that person's time so that happens. So, they get, so his disciples, well-wishers, followers, get more of his association, develop more attraction for him, attachment for him. And then when, they, when he leaves, that breaks their heart, and that's good. It's good in a sense because it shows that there is love there. 
There is a, the feeling of loss, and he's there. <coughs> but then sometimes Krishna will take somebody just immediately without all of that. We have the example of Tamal Krishna Goswami. We were in Mayapur, and it was Mangalarti time. And uh, Maharaj had been there for a couple of weeks. He was doing kirtan every night with devotees in different places around Mayapur. Were you there at that time? It was in 2002. Two. Yeah, it was 2002. Uh, yeah, and then the next one morning he had to leave, so he hired a car. And we were all in Mongol Arti, and right at the end of Mongol Arti, I think, I can't, I can't remember what point, announcement came that Tamal Krishna Goswami has had a very terrible accident. So everybody jumped in their cars, and we got into the scene, and then it was too obviously he had already left. So that was a shock from everyone. No one expected that to happen. But sometimes Krishna arranges that for for whatever reason to sometimes to avoid uh, giving difficulty to the great soul with having so many people around him and crying and lamenting his inevitable departure. But Krishna works in both ways. Whatever is best for that soul's departure, he arranges nicely. So, so when we experience the loss of someone who is close to us, usually a devotee, maybe it's a devotee relative, maybe it's our spiritual master, maybe it's someone we had a lot of nice association and there's so many, so many memories of that association. And we can, uh, we can take that to heart and by... And it says for disciples, when the spiritual master leaves, the disciples should cry. It's in the, it's in the, uh, Satsarup Maharaj brings that out in one, it's one play, what is the name of that particular king and queen, Vidarbi, and uh, what was the king's name? I can't remember. So that when he left, she cried. That point was made that the disciple should cry about <coughs> the disappearance of the spiritual master. And that crying is actually increasing their love for Krishna because in one sense, what, do, what does the spiritual master represent in the life of his disciple, Krishna? That's... That's his representation. So that relationship is direct and indirect at the same time. So, so no one should fear death. We should only fear wasting time. What does that mean? We should use whatever time we have while we're still here to perfect our Krishna consciousness, and then when it's time to go back home, back to Godhead, you'll be ready. Because if we're not ready, then when we leave, when it's time to leave, we'll be thinking, oh my God, I should have been more Krishna conscious. I shouldn't, uh, why did I waste time doing this? Why did I waste time in this way or that one? So that lamentation is really quite pitiable we don't want to go through that. We want to think, I gave everything as much as I could. Now it's up to Krishna. Yeah. So in the case of His Holiness Kadamba Kanana Maharaj, he showed by example how to leave the world. It was amazing. I was with his spiritual master in July last year in Jai, Jai Dwayda Maharaj. And when I was talking, I brought up the subject of Kadamba Karma, that why he's not doing anything to try to cure his disease. Yeah, and he, and he said he doesn't want to waste time. 
you're running to this specialist, that specialist, this doctor, that doctor, this, you know. He just wants to focus on Krishna consciousness and just absorb himself. And he did, in a very exemplary way. He continued preaching, continued meeting devotees, continued to uh, have kirtans a lot. He did everything he was no normally doing, but he did it in an accelerated way. <laughs> and then, of course, as gradually as the body broke down, he could only do smaller and smaller amounts, but he was always fixed on the idea that, you know, I'm going to be leaving soon, so. And he showed by example that we shouldn't be fearful of that. We should be fearful of wasting time. That's the, that's the great fear. Because nobody knows how much time they have. That's the thing. Sometimes we, we, we hear of someone we know who leaves the body at a very young age. And we think, oh, that was unexpected. Especially in Kali Yuga, when there's so many added ways by which the body can be, you know, destroyed. When Kali Yuga, we increased different ways on how to die faster, simply by our lifestyle. It's the lifestyle that's doing it. Of course, devotees try not to plug into that lifestyle. If you leave a simple lifestyle, like have cows, <laughs> crops, live simply, try to uh, become self-sufficient, not depending on the outside world. And that that's a healthy life. That's a healthy life. Because this body can can go on for many, many years. Many, many years. But we have to live in such a way as not to somehow or other minimize our time by living properly and absorbing ourselves as much as we can along with taking care of our responsibilities in Krishna consciousness. So that takes some determination. So no one should fear death, should fear just wasting time because it'll happen. It's just a matter of getting ready for it, that's all. Maharaj Pariksit prepared himself. His Holiness Gadabha Maharaj did the same thing in a very exemplary way. Prabhupada did that also with us to show us how to leave the body. He prepared himself and he he used his time the last few months simply to instruct his disciples on different points in Krishna consciousness. It was like when he was sitting in his bed, the devotees were around Srila Prabhupada. And there was a very sadness. It was kind of like a, a very visible form of mourning that the devotees were going through. And Prabhupada looked at him and said, don't think this won't happen to you. <laughs> Get ready. <laughs> so, <clears throat> therefore, you know, just like people think, well, that's the worst thing. If you live for things in this world, it is the worst thing. But if you live for the Spirit, you live for Krishna, you live for devotional service. There's a whole realm of existence way beyond this world that actually is real. As Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, when everything is when all everything is destroyed in this world, that place remains as it is. It's eternal and it always will be the eternal place, the home of all living beings, the spiritual world. But we don't belong here. You know, it's like, what are you gonna do? Make the best use of a bad bargain. What do you do? You have kirtan, you hear about Krishna. Chant, dance, take prasadam. Take care of some basic needs in order to live in this world. But these are all secondary at best. Our real, our real business is this verse, Shrinvanti, Gayanti, 
smaranti abhiksnasya, to hear, chant, to serve, to remember the glories of the Lord. If we do that, and then when the time comes when this body is no longer functionable, then we're ready. We're ready. Prabhupada called, says, and there's a machine, Prabhupada said, it's called the Deki machine. It's a wheat, wheat husking machine. <clears throat> and Prabhupada's talking this, and he says, if you take the wheat husking machine and you put it on this planet, what does it do? It husks wheat. If you take it to the high, higher planets, heavenly planets, what is it going to do? It's going to husk wheat. Wherever you take it, it does the same thing. That's a devotee. A devotee here lives for Krishna, hears and chants the glories of the Lord here. And if they go someplace else, they do the same thing. And then eventually, if they reach the spiritual world, and then it becomes, you know, the reality of, our, of one's existence. We gotta get out of this place. It's the last thing we ever do. You remember that song? That was before your time. It was a rock and roll song. We gotta get out of this place. You know, when they say, I can get no satisfaction. Yeah, I can get no satisfaction. <laughs> Well, that's another one. <laughs> yeah. When I grew up in the 60s and 70s, these were the new. It was this breaking out from the old realm and expressing, you know, just throwing away the whole and looking for life in a different way. So when there were so many songs, persons representing change, change, change. But what were they changing for? They were just changing the material. That's all. This material is no good. Let's get something better. But we're, we're talking about change that is actually beneficial. That is, the activities of the soul's existence. The House of the Rising Sun. <laughs> Remember that one? Yeah. Goes back. And then the one, there's another one. He's not the kind you wind up on Sunday. I don't know if you remember that one. Jethro Tull? The rock band. And what they're saying is that people worship God just once a week. That's not the kind you just turn on on Sunday and the rest of the week. God is meant for every day of the week. That was the message of that song. Yeah. Pretty good in those days, you know. It was like there was some vision towards something better, something spiritual. And Children of the Revolution? Children of the Revolution, T-Rex? I don't remember that one. Mama! Mama! Yeah. Mama. So, yeah. So when the great souls leave, they again they give us a nice message. Uh, uh, this world is what it is. It's temporary. So do what I'm doing. Don't waste time. And Prabhupada said we have our ISKCON in the spiritual world. And we'll all meet again. <laughs> And we'll recognize each other. Oh, hello, Kiki. Yeah, you're here. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah, I remember you were in, what was that place on Earth? Uh, oh, yeah, Croatia. Okay. Yeah, I remember that, that little section of the material world is called Croatia. <laughs> well, I'm glad at least you'll get to see him. <laughs> You better follow. Yeah. <laughs> With a name like Narayan, you can't stay here. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. So there's... Uh, 
And so actually, yeah, those who those who are intelligent, they keep their sight on the future and not so much they live in the present. They live in the present, but their goal is to, they, their goal is you know that place where everything is eternal. And you have your family members there, friends, society, country, love is there, but it's there in a in a way that is of the, the actual substance that it is. This world is a reflection of the reality. So we take on the reflection in this world, but the reality <coughs> is something that has substance. In this world, there's no substance behind it. People live simply to enjoy, and there's no substance to that kind of enjoyment because it's temporary and it's based on selfishness. <laughs> All right, Krishna, you look totally miserable. What what did I say? You look yeah, you look like you're suffering. You're okay. He needs a massage. Yeah. You <laughs> The material world is what it is. But devotees are not in the material world because they do Srinvati, Gayanti, Srinanti, Grinanti, Abhiksnasya. They are hearing, chanting, worshipping. So, Therefore, all of these activities have nothing to do with this realm of existence. So if we stay in these activities, we're actually in the spiritual energy, spiritual world. Prabhupada talks about Lomasa Muni. Lomasa Muni was a very hairy sage, and he had a benediction that every hair on his body he could live for one lifetime of Lord Brahma. And so he was living on the banks of the Holy River. He had no, no dwelling, no home. So he had a few followers. So they said, Maharaj... <coughs> you know, you you know, you know, you have a long life and you don't even have a place to live. Can we build you a cottage? He said, "Don't bother. I'm not going to be here so long." <laughs> so I mean, if somebody lives a hundred years here, we think, "Oh wow, they live a long time." But what is this? It's, can't even you can't even find it in eternal time. It's so small. It's not even it's not even detectable. <laughs> so, you know, time just pushes things along really fast. But eternal time, can you imagine eternal time where, where nothing changes, nothing deteriorates, everything exists eternally? You might say, hmm, well that could be boring, right? <laughs> but actually it's not like that because the soul has reached its stage of ananda, complete joyfulness. And there's a variety in the spiritual world too. You get, you get malati malas, banana bread in the spiritual world, and when you eat it, it stays there. It doesn't deteriorate because in the spiritual world, banana bread, anything spiritual doesn't change. So you eat the banana bread and it's still there. You get the experience and the banana bread stays there. <laughs> you eat a glubjamin and the glubjamin still exists. <laughs> Try to figure that one out. <laughs> well, that's then, because the spiritual world means nothing Nothing is created and nothing is, you know, annihilated. Everything exists in its pure spiritual essence. 
Hopefully there's the remains in the stomach. Well, the stomach's is also eternal, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> you have a transcendental stomach. <laughs> Yeah, so this is so we have something to look forward to. Where the materialists, what are they looking forward to? They live according to what happens in this world, and their happiness and is dependent on the fulfillment of their desires. And most of the times, they can't fulfill their desires, and even when they do, it's not. It doesn't give them the satisfaction they want. Therefore, nobody in this world is happy. Prabhupada could say that, and he would say it often. No one is happy. People pretend that they're happy because they have plans to become happy. Material life means you make your plans, and that plan keeps you moving in that direction so you can fulfill that, thinking that when I fulfill that plan or that desire, that I'll be happy. But that's the, that's the donkey and the carrot, you know. <laughs> The donkey is moving along and the carrot is in front of the donkey. The donkey thinks one more step, I'll get that carrot, but the carrot's also moving with the donkey. And then the donkey keeps walking and the carrot keeps moving. He never gets the carrot. <laughs> because the carrot because every step he takes, the carrot is connected to you have like a stick coming from the donkey's back string hanging the carrot. So the donkey's moving, obviously the carrot's moving too. That's material life. They keep going for their plants, but then they never get it. And even if they get it, then it doesn't give them the satisfaction. The carrot is, you know, rotten. Just material life. What can you do? So is there any happiness in this material world? <laughs> Well, if we are to assume that which we are happy if we live in Krishna consciousness, then yeah. Well, that's Krishna consciousness, yeah. But I'm saying, in the material world, is there any happiness? Well, there is, but it's very... Limited. Limited, Limited yeah. 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 It arises like pop-up. But that, then, that questions what would you consider happiness? Is it, is it pleasure? Like through material sense, like yeah. senses. Or... Well, they, they, you know, one one poet, he said, contemporary of Lord Shaitan, he said, he said the happiness in the material world is like a drop of water in the desert. If you're in a desert, you're looking for, you know, a reservoir because you're thirsty. So somebody gives you a drop, you think that person's my enemy. He's making my life even more miserable by giving me one drop. So, yeah, viapity. He says, yeah, happiness in this world is friendship, society, and love. So people get a little bit of satisfaction from family life. And they call that happiness. That's material life. But then again, that's also fraught with a lot of difficulties and struggles and miseries. But if, it, if a person is satisfied with that one drop, then uh, they can't, actually, they can't be satisfied because the soul's nature is to want pleasure continuously and not a drop here and a drop there and a drop there and a drop there and then you drop, you know? <laughs> 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 and you get a chance to do it all over again. And you come out again, yay, you're a little baby and you're passing stool everywhere in the diapers and your mother's thinking that it's chattasuzana, it smells so nicely, just like fragrant sandalwood paste. That's called love. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so you have to go through all that and you have to learn one and one is two again. Two and two is four, and start all over. And then you get through another life, and then you start again with the same thing. So why waste time? This material world is a place of punishment for the soul. 
soul wants to be separate from Krishna. All right, here you. But you can play. You can play act that separateness out in this world. That's what it is. But Srinanti, Gayanti, Vinanti, Avikshmasya. One who hears, chants, serves, and remembers personality of Godhead. They're not part of this world anymore. And when they, when the body ends, they'll they'll be back where their consciousness is, because consciousness is life. When our consciousness is in Krishna, we're with Krishna. When our consciousness is in whatever else it is, that's where we are. So that's why we say become Krishna conscious. <laughs> that's all. And, you know, Prabhupada, Lord Chaitanya has made it quite pleasant. There's so many activities that make up the process of Krishna consciousness that are all on the absolute platform. You can hear about Krishna, speak about Krishna. You can worship Krishna in different ways, take Krishna prasadam. You can do different services that are in relationship to Krishna. There's so many things you can do. It's not limited. Okay. Any questions? Yes, sir, I don't know. Thank you, Maharaj, for this inspiring and realistic lecture. Well, I I was asked to speak on it, so... Yeah. Uh, okay. I have some um, questions. Yeah, okay, sure. So one is that whenever I speak with uh, the oldest for 60, 70 years old, mm -hmm. the, you ask them about how they are maybe preparing or how they are feeling, but all of them are feeling young. And they don't understand why they are that age. Mm -hmm. So they are not uh, connected to the age. They feel very young. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if, if this you, is something... You mean they have a lot of plans still? Yeah, like, you know, I think they have, because they feel young, so they feel like they have so many years ahead of them, you know, to, to do so many services more, to do so many things more. So I'm not sure that they are actually preparing or are able to prepare themselves in the mind that this body is deteriorating. Yes, yeah, it's, yeah. it's going down. I can see it. What I did last year, I can't do this year. Yeah. What I did two months ago is becoming more difficult now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the deterioration process becomes more noticeable as you get and on in years. So that feeling of young is that the soul is somehow experiencing the happiness of Krishna consciousness. So that illuminates the body. But still, the body is going is to go. So, so we shouldn't uh, let allow that feeling to interfere with the reality. And therefore, in the... Uh, the Sri Sampradaya, they have made this statement, the devotees quoted, two things you should always remember and two things you should always forget. The two things you should always forget, forget all of the good things you did for other people, that way you don't become proud, and forget all of the bad things people have done to you, that way you can live without feeling unhappy about what happened. And two things you should always remember. You should remember that death can happen at any time and remember the holy name. So that's a statement. So remembering that death can happen at any time is actually a conscious... It's not... You don't, you don't live in a fearful thing, but you live in the sense that I don't want to waste time. That's all. <clears throat> Whatever I have to do in the material world to maintain my body and family... I'll do that, but I won't make it my project. It's not my main thing. My main thing is to hear and chant in the glories of the Lord and to associate with and serve others who are doing the same. That's my main business. I might have to take care of my body. I might have to have some occupation, 
but let me do that and get what I need and then go on. Then uh, get, get focused on the real business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's all. You, you just, you know, the more you try to make a better material arrangement, the more you find that every time you do that, something else comes up to destroy that. <laughs> It's just like, it's the way the material world works. So live, uh, you know, take care of your basic needs. That's required. But it's not, a, it's not the goal. There was one man, he was, uh, he was a fruitarian. He had discovered this diet where you live just on fruit. And he, he was from Germany, I think came to the United States, and uh, he was propagating that. He was going to different places, speaking about it. He also wrote about it. And at one point, they did a health check on him to see, and his health was optimum, really good. You know, for his age, he was much more healthy than people were of that age. And so he was also becoming more and more popular. So one day, he gave a lecture somewhere, I think it was in California, and he came out, and he was walking along the street, and there was some, somebody had spilled some oil. I think it was, you know, like, sometimes the cars drip oil from the... And so he stepped on that, and he slipped and fell. He hit his head, and he died. He died healthy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's just the way the world is, you know. You can have the max, the maximum amount of health, and then something will come along and <laughs> change, change it. We had a similar case here of one uh, gentleman who was very nice. He was not a devotee, but he was very favorable. And he took a lot of books. He knew the devotees. He used to come for programs. He was very proud of this. He he's, uh, he defeated some with some internal um, ulcers or or even tumor, cancer, something in. in you know, inside abdomen. In abdomen, I'm not sure where. Once he uh, he survived that, and then he was like running uh, marathons, 40 kilometers, 50, and he was telling to everybody this and that. And then again, after a few years, he got a, this melanoma cancer somewhere on the face or something. And he was so, you know, depressed, uh, dejected, like, you know, how, how is possible? How that happened? You know, why God is. Uh, letting me go, you know, because I just, you know, I'm here living healthy, I'm vegetarian, I mean, he was real, like, just did, and he was propagating this a lot, you know, he was quite a popular person, but then he, he died in this, this uh, completely bewildered, you know, why is this happening, why yeah. I got cancer again? Yeah, Padam Padam, Yav Vi Padam. You don't know, danger at every step. Yeah, well, yeah, well, there was one really sad story. It happened in Mumbai. I was there, we were preaching in one medical college with the devotees from Chowpati. And many students were coming, we were doing regular programs. And many of the students were becoming really more you know, enthusiastic to hear and take part in the programs. So one boy, he was coming regularly, and. He told his friends, classmates, he said, uh, uh, you know, I want to graduate top in my class. So I'm not going to go to the classes anymore. I'm not going to go to the uh, meet the devotees. And when I graduate, I'll come back. So it was about three months before graduation. And so he did, dedicated his whole time to really study. And he graduated top in his class. He was the the best, he got the best marks, perfect marks. So now, after he graduates, his friends came back to him and said, you know, devotees are coming to the college tonight. Oh, why don't you come for the program? He said, well, that's nice, but there's a party tonight, you know, school party. So I want to go to the party. So what could they do? So he went to the party and he started dancing. And in the middle of the dance floor, he collapsed and had a heart attack and died. 23 years old. 
no medical history. All of a sudden. And right after that, boy, his friends got real serious. <laughs> but it was kind of sad. I was there at the time. It was sad because, you know, for some reason, he lost that uh, attraction that he had developed for Krishna consciousness. And now he was famous in school. I think the party was part of, you know, celebrating his, you know, Achieve. graduation, achievements, and all of that. So he became more enamored with that. And then Krishna said, well, if I let you go any longer, maybe you'll get even worse. Krishna will do that. Krishna knows what's going to happen in the future. And Krishna always warns us by trying to attract us in such a way as to stay more and more in Krishna consciousness. But if he sees a devotee who's really serious, and then that devotee somehow goes away, he might give that devotee some difficulty just to bring him back again. Or if he sees that the devotee will not come back because he knows, then he might take that devotee at that time before the devotee goes further down. Because Krishna knows the future. But he tries to change the future by reminding us what we're supposed to do. He knows the future, but he also tries to help us come back to what we're supposed to be doing. So sometimes he creates a situation where the devotee can't enjoy anymore and they have to surrender. Second question, huh? Is that both questions? No. One more? Yes. Okay. Uh, Sorry. This year, a friend of mine lost her son, mm. and it was sudden. And uh, I spoke with her recently, and it's been a time now, but they're saying they're feeling like they're, they're also died. They cannot recover. Yeah. In any, in any sense. So I'm just wondering, um, in this situation, if we lo lose our loved ones and their devotees, is there any way uh, of, in the way they left their body, that we actually know wh wh what is their destination? destination? It's hard to say. It's really hard to say. Even a lot of times when we see someone, we also try to say something that Sounds like you know, this is what will happen, but you can't really say. Just like when the famous Jayananda, he was famous for doing Rathiyatras. And Prabhupada had a lot of regard for him because he gave everything for Krishna conscious. So when he left the body, <laughs> Prabhupada said, Jayananda, he went back to the spiritual world. Or, if he, if he still had a little bit of material desire, then he's with Krishna somewhere in the material world. So Prabhupada didn't really even say clearly. He said, well, he either went back to the spiritual world or he's now with Krishna in somewhere in the material world associating with Krishna in his pastimes there. Now, even Prabhupada gave two possibilities of her surrender. So we don't really know. It's hard to say. It's really hard to say. Because you can't see everything about the person. It's not possible. Yes, because we can see actually that even some really big souls, they left their bodies in a car accident. Yeah. Yeah. In different ways. And then you are. Maharaj just... says that actually Krishna is involved in that with. Yeah. 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 So there was meant to be like, yeah, for, for those who have are surrendered to Krishna fully, then he, he may use a material situation to bring that person back to him. But if you're thinking in the case of Tamal Krishna, when you go when you study the situation you find that he left instantaneously. It was 
practically, you know, as soon as the accident happened, he was gone. But even if it's not, what's, what's the difference? Well, the thing is, Krishna avoided him from having any material suffering. Sometimes we can see that the devotees also suffer, but that doesn't mean that you know, he will not reach the... Yeah, right. But, well, that little bit, whatever suffering is there, is it maybe a little bit of uh, residue karma, of karma yeah. that needs to be cleaned, cleaned away. Because you see situations, I know a few situations where devotees have had children in this world, and these children don't last more than a couple of years, and then they... And then they somehow, you know, leave their body. I had a, my god sister was telling me about her own daughter. The girl was constantly being saved from death. She was just a little kid. And she would, you know, do different things and they would always save her from death. But one day, it was John Mastami, and nobody was watching her. She fell into a swimming pool in the Detroit temple, he had a swimming pool, and she left the body, it was three, she was three years old. So she was, her mother was explaining in very detail that she was sure that this soul came into the world just to, to finish up a little bit of uh, you know, karma and then went back to the spiritual world. So it's like that sometimes, someone comes in this world, they have a little bit left, and they finish it up. Yeah. But also to bring a lot of pain to someone else as well. Sometimes, it depends on the state of mind. That's also there, yeah, that can possibly happen. We heard the, the story, you, I, I think you told this story like, Gordon gives, Gordon, Gordon takes. You remember this? In when India. some devotee, they killed a child or something with a, with a car. You told me this once. And then the parents came and Gordon gives, Gordon takes. This is not very high consciousness. <laughs> That's why they had Gordon. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, well, when somebody close to us leaves, if there's some sadness, some lamentation, some crying, that's normal. That's to be expected. But you don't carry it on for years. <laughs> that's, that's the thing. That's the initial experience that you go through. And then, after a while, then you start to realize that this is the way life is, and, and you move on. And you realize that same person who you knew as your relative is somewhere else. For, for non-devotees, that's very, that's like the hardest thing they can yeah. experience. It's like with your greatest suffering, even in worse than, than, than your own suffering, or your own disease, or, or, or accidents, or anything. Like that, uh, there was a Shida Maharaj was telling that example of a, uh, some rich man, millionaire, billionaire, whatever, uh, landed with a helicopter on the helicopter pad there somewhere on his building and his wife and child came you know and he took child oh where are you my and he took it like this and then you know this helicopter that killed the, the the child instantly oh he didn't and even see all, it they were all like i i think mother died like in few days from the shock and he was like he became dumb for a life or something like that you know it's like <laughs> it's really shocking yeah well, it's naturally get attached to family members, especially children. But, but you have to see one thing also that these these persons that play the role of your friend or son or daughter are belong to Krishna, actually. Možda nam je bilo to dijete neprijatelj u prošlom životu ko... Yeah, maybe the kid was our enemy in our previous life. Previous life. Ko će traketno... Yeah, that happens also. <laughs> Come, sometimes it comes back just to get pain for someone. It's a material thing, <laughs> what it is. It's a crazy place. It's, it's crazy. But, but this just makes me wonder if somebody was to come back just to finish up a couple of years of karma, so then just how much does Krishna take 
when it comes to karma because we are to assume we have been here for many many lives right. collecting karma right. and so Krishna takes a lot of that karma away because we practice Krishna consciousness right. mm-hmm. but that means that he doesn't necessarily take all of it at, at the it's time pro- of death. It's a process. Prabhupada used the example when you begin Krishna consciousness he uses the example the fan is turning and the plug is in. So as soon as you begin Krishna Khan, you pull out the plug. That doesn't mean that the, that the fan stops turning. It will, if you stay in the process after a while, you will come to the point that there is no more material karma left. Then whatever happens to you after that, if it appears to be good or bad, is simply Krishna's arrangement for you. That's all. It's no longer karma anymore. He like if even if you're like you're free from all your karma, but you do something wrong, you act wrong, you commit an offense, you get a little slap. It's just to remind you that this is not what you should be doing. But for the non-devotees, because they live for everything in this world, when they lose it, they suffer. Yeah. And I even know devotees also. When someone dear to them is lost, they, they can't go on anymore. You mean by like they... Lose they lose all their enthusiasm for everything. Yeah. Yeah. Or if something happens to their guru also. Yeah, yeah especially that. Yeah. yeah, the more dear someone is to you, the more it hurts when they leave. But that's this world. But but is that based just in ignorance, in terms of like leaving Krishna consciousness because your guru died? Okay. Uh, the initial lamentation is is good. It's purifying. But your spiritual master is there. He came to lift you up. Now, if you have any love for him, you'll stay in the process and try to perfect your life just to please him instead of going the other way. <laughs> you see the point? Yeah. You, you'll, be, you'll please him if you continue and make progress because that's what pleases the spiritual master the most, seeing his disciple becoming Krishna conscious more and more. So to stop that means it's just to cause more pain to the spiritual master. But the initial shock, the feeling, the lamentation, these things are normal. We don't criticize that, but it shouldn't it shouldn't shouldn't make your Krishna consciousness go down. giving his expression of uh, I want to do something different. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Mm -hmm. Krishna Premi. Uh, Thank you, Guru Maharaj, for the class. Uh, My question is about wasting time. Uh, Because sometimes when I'm in Maya, uh, I cannot understand it. And I'm just wasting time. But after some time, you know, when you're with devotees or you chant nicely, you get this understanding. Oh, I was wasting time. Yeah, that's so, what that's what devotee association does. It gives you knowledge. <laughs> yeah, but what to do when uh, you uh, you are in Maya, but you don't understand that you are in Maya? So what to do in this situation? That's why you get married. <laughs> your husband will tell you you're in Maya. 
And then tell him, you know what you're in mind. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you're helping each other. <laughs> That's the purpose of marriage, to help each other get out of Maya. <laughs> Yeah, so you're lucky. I have to figure it out for myself. <laughs> even even if I'm in Maya, people won't tell me. <laughs> even if I ask them, they still won't tell. <laughs> what to do? There you have you have you have security there. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> but uh, uh, I hear that uh, that is not proper to say to her and you are in Maya. Even if you <laughs> it is not nice to tell him. Oh. Yeah. Because what else have you yeah. not accept from you? Just send a wife. text message. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, leave a note. Yeah. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> uh, my dear husband, I think you got the wrong association. <laughs> And then he will divorce. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Then he will divorce. <laughs> you wrote the you wrote the situation. No, no, that, that no, 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 that's not what I mean. <laughs> Associating with Maya, I'm saying that's the wrong association. <laughs> well, to get right down to the essence, a wife has to tell the husband what he needs to hear without telling him. Mm. Artist. It's called, it's called women's intuition. They know how to say something without saying it. Wow. Only women know that. I, I can't explain it. <laughs> I, I, I think they forgot about that. Maybe there's some shasta. <laughs> <laughs> Sounded good fun to slokas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we always say that. Because if you tell the husband what to do, even if you're right, he won't do it. <laughs> yeah, because and the worst thing that the husband is to have his wife tell him what to do. But you have to tell him what to do by by not telling him what to do. <laughs> That's that's an art you you learn. That's because uh, man is suffering from this toxin masculinity. Yes, men have big faults. Masculinity. Yeah, men have big egos. Well, that's a proper. <laughs> that's, a pro that's a propaganda. Yeah. Nowadays, that men should not be men; they should be like a woman, and then everything will be great. <laughs> <laughs> then. Well, they're doing that nowadays. It's called gay marriage. <laughs> but if a man, if a man listens to his wife, he becomes demasculated. Yeah. He becomes that's why he doesn't. Want, then he becomes useless, you know. Really. So, just like there was one one devotee, she told me. I used to tell my husband what to do, and he would say to me, I know what you're saying is right, but because you tell me, I can't do it. He would say that. So that's just the way, that's the male ego. Thank you. <laughs> Trying to figure that one out so much, huh? <laughs> In our country, there is a saying like that a woman can make uh, her husband a king or a beggar or a drunk like that, you know? How does that like work? She, she can make him like yeah. that. And we can actually see this because tough women, they make really their their husbands uh, weak and Chicken. poor, alcoholic yeah. and, and like that. <laughs> And yeah. women actually who support their husband and who are not saying, as you said, who are not saying directly, but you know, they find their ways. You can feel, you can see that these they husbands get, are... Yeah, they get strength from Yes. That. Yeah. The, yeah, the better hat. 
It's true. There's a whole psychology of men and women. If you know that psychology, you can avoid a lot of problems. One Mormon lady, she wrote a very good book about that. Very, very good book about that. Mm. So it's everything. The philosophy is, is, is explained there. The woman Bible. Yeah, like a woman Bible, yeah. <laughs> Uh, regarding men, but... Uh, I guess it's good for marriage counseling. <laughs> Maybe not for the Jews, she's like from the ancient time. <laughs> Rana Swami was telling one story. It was a big public program. It was about 500 people. No, it was more than that. It was in India. Telling us. Husband and wife are arguing, arguing, and arguing. And now the relationship is getting, starting to fall apart. And finally, they decided we got to do something to try to save this. So they went to some marriage counselor. So marriage counselor, when they're good, they, they know how to, they ask the right questions. So he asked, Man, what is it about your wife that is causing you to become unhappy? And then the man went right to the point. He said, well, she often makes bread. And when she cuts the bread, she gives me the end piece. And she keeps the other part. Cause for divorce. <laughs> <laughs> So, but the thing is, he had forgotten that his wife is Italian. And in Italy, if they give you the end piece, that's the best piece. So that saved the marriage. <laughs> she was actually giving him the best piece according to her understanding, which was a cultural thing. But he didn't see that. So he was thinking, she doesn't love me. It's obvious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was the whole situation. So a lot of times relationships break down because lack of communication. That's one of the reasons. Or misunderstanding. We assume things, but the assumption is not necessarily correct. That's why you bring it out, discuss it, come to some understanding. We got into another subject, <laughs> marriage counseling. <laughs> okay, so uh, how are we doing on time? Entered. And thirty. Anything else? Any other points? Discussions? I have a question. <clears throat> uh, do you know of your god brother, proper disciple, who got first? Uh, I mean, this is connected because I'm not sure whether that person is still alive. That he got the first, second, and sannyas on the ones on the spot. Yeah, it was Gregor Vindamaraj. That's Gorgo Vindamaraj. Yeah. Well, well, Prabhupada met Gorgo Vindamaraj. Oh, really? He gave him first, second, and, and sannyas all at once, everything. Oh, is it? Well, I yeah. When uh, Bhakti Charu Maharaj, he gave him, I think he gave him first. Sec second and sannyas. Second and sannyas, yeah. yeah. But he was, he was already initiated before. Yeah. But Gorgo Vindamaraj got all, everything. Oh, okay. That was the, the one and only. Yeah. Prabhupada could understand this person is, you know. Because he came to Prabhupada when he was around 45 years old. So he had, you know, lived a good part of his life in Krishna consciousness. Yeah. And the guru can do that. It's not like against the etiquette.
But that's rare. Anything else? <laughs> do you have something to do after now? Or am I holding up anything? Prasad. Oh, Is yeah, that breakfast, breakfast or lunch? Breakfast. <laughs> Supposed to be breakfast. Brunch. Oh, I'm holding up breakfast. No, now. you're not. No. <laughs> we I like you to talk to you as many hours possible. We ate late uh, yesterday, so. <laughs> 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 Swamiji's making those fast. <laughs> I took breakfast at 7.30. I just, I just a light one, because I didn't eat anything last night. So I took a light breakfast. Some, just some fruit and some nuts, that's not. But if you guys want to have breakfast, we're, we're supposed to have lunch at 11.30. Let's so. one more. <laughs> <laughs> so, is it ready? Is the breakfast ready? Yes. Yes. The book distributors have come through. <laughs> now he's the prashadam distributor. <laughs> okay. The eagerness for prashadam is Krishna consciousness. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. See the by. You know that? Chandra Mahal's by Archie.